with Zoom, the way the format uh, works with Zoom, the way we do this thing is um, our presentation, uh, while it's, it's ongoing, if you have any questions or comments, please type them into the chat box. And uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, um, David Schwartz will read out the questions and um, Jonathan will, uh, will answer them and we'll have a bit of a discussion perhaps. Um, also, I'd like to mention um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Berkowitz that uh, on August 3rd at the temple, it'll be our first um, event in person at the temple and I think a good three years now. Uh, and that'll be uh, John Silver, um, a trio <clears throat> of operas. That's Wednesday, August the 3rd at 7 p.m. We've had a, a pretty big uh, sign up already. So look for that email or go to the Temple Shalom website and you can sign up then and it's free. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping. Let me just say that it's a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Jonathan Berkowitz, our favorite wordsmith. And I'm going to turn it over to him now for Tales from the Word Guy, entertaining English. Over to you, Dr. Berkowitz. Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> it's a delight to be uh, back uh, speaking to the uh, Men and Women's Club of Temple Shalom, looking at, uh, looking at the screen. Uh, this, uh, the talk tonight, I hope, hope will be a, uh, an antidote to all the bad news, all the miserable things one reads uh, uh, in the newspaper, listens to on radio, watches on television. We could all use a good laugh. And <clears throat> so what I've chosen to talk about today uh, are some of the entertaining aspects of our English language. Uh, just as a bit of a preamble, uh, for the past seven years, actually, I'm fi just finishing my seventh year, uh, I've appeared on CBC uh, Radio, the weekend morning program, North by Northwest. The first year, <clears throat> I was billed as the puzzling professor. And from, uh, from that uh, first year uh, came my first book, which uh, was the topic of, or made up part of the topic of the uh, first talk that I did, The World of Words. Um, after that, that uh, opening year, I morphed into, or at least was re, uh, renamed, The Word Guy. And for the past six years, I have uh, once a month uh, talked about some aspect of the English language. And these aspects are about the evolution of language, uh, usage, all of the things that uh, uh, maybe you learned, maybe you didn't. Uh, and if you did learn it, maybe you forgot it. Uh, so the full name of the, uh, the book, uh, the second book, it's called uh, Tales from the Word Guy, and the subtitle is What Your English Teacher Never Taught You. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, afterwards, but that is uh, um, uh, the basis of, uh, that's where I have uh, extracted uh, or developed uh, today's talk about. And the, the last part of the book is called Entertaining uh, English. So a little bit of uh, a preamble. We, uh, we use our language every day, but how many of us actually think about how it's constructed? For example, where do words actually come from? And speaking of words, uh, what exactly is a word? Why do we spell them and, and pronounce them uh, the way we do? Uh, and more uh, amusingly, what happens when language goes wrong? How can you create humor? Uh, from using the language uh, cleverly. So uh, today we're going to talk about various sources of amusement with the language gone wrong, misused words, uh, what happens when you mess up the syntax and you put modifiers in the wrong place, mixed metaphors, misheard song lyrics, and probably my favorite category of all wordplay, which is puns, witticisms, uh, and we'll end with ambiguous headlines. So we'll start with, and we'll kind of go back and forth between uh, <clears throat> the 
uh, misuse of uh, English when it's either intentional or unintentional. Because when you when you misuse it intentionally, that's where you get interesting witticisms and puns. Um, just as amusing are the unintentional ones. So we'll start with an un unintentional uh, uh, kind of uh, word play or word uh, error uh, called a spoonerism. And uh, you'll notice that it has a, a little title before it. It's called a word botcher, which is what happens when you botch up words. But a spoonerism means that you switch the, uh, the first consonant sounds in a phrase. So the W and the B of word and botcher were actually in the wrong order. And if you flip them, then you would get bird watcher. And so a bird watcher and a word botcher would be called a spoonerism. Now, this is um, called a, a, slip of, uh, a slip of the tongue. If you want a fancy word for it, you can call it a parapraxis. Um, nobody really uses that, uh, that technical term. Um, if, it's, uh, if, if you call a slip of the tum, tongue a lapsus linguae, what would you call a slip of the pen? That's actually called a lapsus calami. And a slip, a slip of the memory is a lapsus memory or memory. Now, um, a Freudian slip is what happens when you, uh, you make, make some unintended uh, or unconscious or subdued wish. There's a famous example of uh, Oedipus saying one thing and meaning his mother. And so you realize uh, uh, that that's based on knowing about uh, Oedipus. Um, what would you prefer, bread and butter or cake? And he says, bed and butter. So they can be a little bit risque uh, as well. But the best known slip of the tongue, this uh, idea of a spoonerism, comes from the Reverend uh, William Archibald Spooner, who was uh, a warden of New College in Oxford from 1903 to 1924. Now, he's uh, credited with an awful lot of these kinds of, uh, of uh, mistakes. Uh, unfortunately, very few of them are, can actually be traced to, to what he said. So uh, we, we think he may have said these, but perhaps not. Uh, Martin me, Padam, but you are occupying the wrong pie. And of course, when we straighten that out, it's pardon me, madam, but you were occupying the wrong pew. May I sew you to another sheet? And you can, uh, you have to actually say them and read them uh, to get the full effect. This is one of my favorites. I have in my bosom a half warmed fish, which is uh, not quite as pleasant as a half formed wish. It is customary to cuss the bride. Uh, hopefully not, the marriage won't last and our queer old Dean becomes our dear old queen. Um, there's a, a great story about uh, Reverend Spooner that uh, he was at a dinner party and uh, somebody spilled uh, salt on the tablecloth. And so he got out the, uh, red, his glass of red wine and poured red wine all over the salt. He kind of got mixed up that uh, if you spill red wine, then you're supposed to put salt on it. And he jumped into action and poured the, uh, uh, the red wine all over the, the salt. Whether that's true or not, it's a great, uh, a great story. Uh, spoonograms are sentences that you can create that use spoonerisms. So I have a long, uh, a long list of, uh, of uh, these spoonograms. I'll just pick out a few that I particularly like. Um, the restaurant could not serve rack of lamb due to a lack of ram. Uh, for all of us uh, who, uh, for Canadians for whom religion is hockey uh, and Judaism, uh, those whose religion is hockey might substitute the goalie host for the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> the running cat chased the cunning rat. The groundskeeper sent a message by Morse code that they had the course mode. And so you can find lots of, uh, of uh, switches of this uh, sort. Coast guard could be a ghost card. I'm aware of, uh, I'm always aware of, or looking for uh, this way of, of making, uh, uh, making uh, spoonerisms. So here's a list of uh, some that uh, backing losers, lacking boozers, charred hills. Uh, Shakespeare, 
um, might have actually, or actually had a different uh, title in mind for Taming of the Shrew. It might have been the Shaming of the Shrew. Uh, rake over the coals. And you can see uh, all of the different possibilities. Uh, well, not all of them, but many of them. Friar, uh, fire truck would be Friar Tuck. Now, what you're noticing is that I'm not simply changing the first sound, the first consonant. These are all variations because I'm making uh, other uh, other uh, changes. Um, there is something called a, to go with spoonerism, a knifeerism and a forkerism, coined by a, a cognitive uh, scientist uh, at uh, at Yale. And so now we're going to switch uh, vowels instead of consonants. So light red, let ride. So it's still an L in light and an R in red and an L in let and an R in ride, but we've switched the vowel sounds. So light red and let ride. Deer wakes, weird aches. So sometimes we hear the language in odd ways. This takes one word and it splits it into two. You can, be, uh, you can say optimistically or misty optically. And is there any beer nigh, meaning nearby? Yes, nearby. Uh, because I am also a statistician, love numbers, here's a spoonerism equation. If you take the letters of nine plus 50 and switch the N and the F, then you get fine plus nifty. So the left-hand side is words, the right-hand side is, or uh, left-hand side are, are number words, the right-hand side are just uh, words. Uh, here's another fancy one, six plus five plus three, fix plus thrive plus C. So it, it attunes you to hearing the language in a very different way. So that's um, that's our, our opening uh, talking about spoonerisms. Um, a spooneric is a spoonerized limerick. And this one um, is based on the idea of bebop or bop. And it reads this way. Some kids nowadays, it is said, are too fond of stopping in bed. But according to Spooner, the, 40, the 40s bunch sooner enjoyed themselves bopping instead. So a poem based on uh, Spoonerisms. Let's look at puns. Now, I want you to say these aloud to yourself. I won't be able to hear you. That's one of the... Uh, the uh, disadvantages of being on Zoom. I don't get to hear you laugh or chuckle. Uh, let's, let's try these. These are what happens when you uh, think about the different sounds um, of, of words. Waiter, waiter, what's this? It's bean soup. I can see that, but what is it now? <clears throat> what is a pun? A pun is when two unrelated meanings are suddenly and unexpectedly brought together. And it's that incongruity that makes one laugh or makes one groan. Uh, they have been derided and insulted. Uh, Ira Gershwin, who you know as uh, George Gershwin's brother, and he was the lyricist, he called puns the lowest form of wit simply because so much humor is based on them. Alfred Hitchcock named puns the highest form of, of uh, literature. Uh, Oscar Wilde said, a pun is the lowest form of humor, but only when you don't think of it first. And Edgar Allan Poe, I think this is the neatest uh, summation, of puns it has been said that those who most dislike them are those who are least able to utter them. So go, uh, go forth and create puns. Uh, if somebody complains that punning is the lowest form of humor, you can tell them, well, the prose might be bad, but poetry is verse. So that's my, my offering. Um, classifying puns as good, bad, or indifferent is kind of, uh, um, it's, it's, it takes the fun out of it. In fact, even my, in my view, bad puns are still good. Um, what has four wheels and flies? A garbage truck. And that works because the word flies can either be a verb or a noun. <clears throat> uh, let's try some more of these. A metronome is a dwarf who lives in the Paris underground. A Romeo is someone who ends all his sentences 
with a proposition. One letter difference. And you can actually imagine that uh, this could be a typo. If you're not, uh, if you're not typing these incorrectly, uh, that, could, uh, that could happen. The word elliptical means kiss, as in elliptical. What do you call, uh, now we're going to put some puns together here. What do you call a patronizing prison inmate going down the stairs? That's a condescending con descending. You can tune a guitar, but you can't tune a fish. Unless, of course, you play bass or bass. A good pun is like a good steak. A rare medium, well done. And what's beautiful of that about that one is it is actually a triple pun. Now, you might remember from uh, your childhood, depending on when your childhood was, Tom Swifties. These, uh, these actually peaked in the, uh, in the uh, 1960s. They're sort of uh, uh, contemporary. Tom Swift was a contemporary of Drew uh, uh, and the Hardy Boys. And Tom Swift was a young scientist. Uh, and the, the tales all involved his adventures. So the author wrote dialogue that used adverbs, such as, we must hurry, said Tom swiftly. And from that, came the idea of Tom Swifties. So <clears throat> they're, they are gentle, they're worth uh, bringing back. And um, you'll have favorites, and some of them you won't think, you won't get uh, maybe on first reading, and then it'll dawn on you, oh, of course, that's why. I love pancakes, said Tom flippantly. My pants are wrinkled, said Tom, ironically. The maid has the night off, said Tom, helplessly. These become a bit addictive. It's a little bit like eating potato chips. It's very hard to stop at one. But I hate pineapples, said Tom dolefully. Walk this way, said Tom stridently. My glasses are fogged up, said Tom optimistically. My family has a great future, said Tom clandestinely. And that one makes you have to look at that one again because it's clan and destin. That's the family in the future. I'll have the dark bread with caraway, said Tom Riley. And again, don't look at how it's spelled. Just listen to R-Y-E, Rye. I've lost my flower, said Tom lackadaisically. <clears throat> I'll have to send the telegraph again, said Tom remorsefully. I'm going to kill Dracula, said, said, kill Dracula, said Tom painstakingly. You know how to kill vampires. And frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, said Tom rhetorically. And you say, what, what, what does that mean, rhetorically? Well, who said it? Rhett Butler. That's the rhetorical. And as you can see, I don't know when to stop when it comes to uh, Tom, uh, Tom Swifties. Uh, you can pick some of your favorite, uh, some of your favorites. How about this one? My favorite statue is the Venus de Milo, said Tom disarmingly. I've dropped my toothpaste, said Tom, crestfallenly. <clears throat> you can't even look at uh, after the plant while I'm away, Tom said, witheringly. And we'll leave this last one, or we'll leave with uh, the bottom one. Uh, I hate reading Victor Hugo, uh, said Tom is missing there, said Tom, less miserably. And of course, you have to remember Les Miserables. Still more, let's add some homophones. Do you write fairy tales as well? Asked the brothers grimly. I wonder if this radium is radioactive? Asked Marie curiously. They're addictive, aren't they? I've got 1,760 yards of paddy fields, said Tom with a wry smile. Rice smile. Now, we can take the adverb and make it an adjective. I'm totally disinterested, said the bank manager. The operation has left me feeling quite disfigured, said the accountant. Do you feel disheartened? Asked the cannibal. And I'm nonplussed, said the mathematician. I feel unloved, said the tennis age ace. I've been discharged, said the, uh, uh, said the electrician. Croakers put these together in a, in a different way. I love beagles, Tom dogmatized. Uh, let's uh, let's skip down to this one. This one you need to uh, really concentrate on. You need 28.35 grams of sugar, Tom announced. Did you get that one? 
28.35 grams is an ounce. Uh, I have great beverages, uh, Tom whined with clarity. <clears throat> Look at my shiny kitchen floor, Tom waxed enthusiastically. So that is my, uh, my uh, attempt to bring back these beautiful, gentle, long ago uh, bits of uh, wordplay called Tom Swifties. Um, I actually created a, a music playlist based on puns. And I'm open to uh, contributions. If you can think of some, you, you're welcome to type them into the chat. Here are a number of uh, famous song titles from, uh, well, I'll just say my, my, uh, my era. Uh, here comes the pun, which is uh, the Beatles song, Hot Pun in the Summertime, Pun, Pun, Pun by the Beach Boys, House of the Rising Pun, The Animals, don't let the pun go down on me. You'll recognize that as Elton John. Uh, Bruce Springsteen's Born to Pun. And Queen's Another Pun Bites the Dust. Oh, I have some more. Aquarius, let the pun shine in. Happiness is a warm pun. And girls just want to have pun. And we'll end with the mamas and papas. Pun day, pun day. So if you can think of more, I'm, uh, I encourage you to uh, add to my collection. misspeaking a word using the wrong word um, is called the malapropism this comes from a 1775 uh work by richard sheraton a comedy called the rivals and the lead character mrs malaprop uh, had she she prided herself on her use of english but she had rather a um a linguistic ineptitude shall shall we say I'll read you one of her sentences. Sure, if I reprehend anything in this world, it is the use of oracular tongue and a nice derangement of epitaphs. So what she meant was if she comprehended anything, it was the use of her vernacular tongue and a nice arrangement of epithets. So Mrs. Malaprop and malapropisms um, have led to a whole collection of, of these. Um, Shakespeare used it, um, and many, uh, many since him. He's a wealthy typhoon. The marriage was consummated at the altar. I, I hope not. Uh, it's a nice momentum of the occasion. The specialists charge exuberant fees. My husband is a marvelous lover. He knows all my erroneous zones. That skinny dog looks emancipated. So these are actual statements said by people who should know better, former U.S. Vice President Dan Quayle. Republicans understood the importance of bondage between mother and child. Uh, this is a Calgary uh, City Councilor. Don't get your dandruff up. And you can find the right words to go in here. And this is uh, the Texas governor from some time ago, Rick Perry, who talked about lavatories of innovation and democracy. Apparently, he's never been in laboratory and i'm not even sure if he's been in a laboratory acorns uh, are a version of mal malaprops an acorn that term comes from hearing the word acorn incorrectly so these are a few of my favorites i strain my abominable muscles in the gym there is a certain truth to it i have an amusing antidote to tell you how many times have you heard people maybe even you have done this too mix up the word antidote and anecdote. I haven't eaten all day, I'm ravished. The religious leaders all met for an economical conference instead of ecumenical. When it comes to marriage, I believe in monotony. Again, there may be some truth to that. I found the X-rated movie to be quite erratic. During inspection, he didn't pass mustard. So that is using the wrong words uh, as uh, and called um, malapropisms, eggcorns. They can also be called confusables. Um, they are uh, a great source of, uh, of entertainment when you hear people giving speeches, especially politicians, using uh, inappropriate or not inappropriate, but the wrong word. Now, that was about mis, uh, misspeaking. Now, what if you mishear 
somebody. So <clears throat> there is a class of mishearing uh, aspects of English that are called Mondegreens. And I, I did mention this uh, when I talked a couple of years ago, but it's such a favorite of mine, uh, I'm sharing it again. There is a, a Scottish ballad called The Bonnie Earl Amore. Ye highlands and ye lowlands, oh, where hae you been? Thou hast slay the Earl Amore and laid him on the green. The story is that in 1954, the, uh, the writer Sylvia Wright, she was just a child at the time, and she heard this ballad, but the last line is not, she didn't hear it as laid him on the green. What she heard as the last two lines were, thou hast slay the Earl of Moray and Lady Mondegreen. And she was so upset about the killing of Lady Mondegreen. So, the term Mondegreen has become uh, the <clears throat> become the the term for what we'll call an oral malapropism, uh, hearing a lyric to a word in uh, a lyric to a song part of it incorrectly. The word uh, Mondegreen was actually added to the Oxford English Dictionary twenty years ago, so it is a legitimate uh, uh, part of our vocabulary. Uh, I think all Americans. Uh, know the uh, the opening to the Star Spangled Banner. And it's very nice that they're showing such concern about uh, the Latino man. And they want to know whether he's able to see uh, when they sing this at a at a baseball game. Jose, can you see? And that's how their national uh, anthem uh, starts. <clears throat> I have uh, uh, some from popular songs that uh, until I saw the lyrics years later, Nowadays, it's easy. You can go to Google and uh, ask for the proper lyrics of a song. But when all you heard was on the radio or on your record and there were no, uh, and there were no liner notes, there were no uh, lyrics attached, you had to make a good guess uh, or your best guess at what the lyric was. Uh, there are, I would say, <coughs> of uh, Elton John's uh, greatest hits, I'm sure half of them, uh, I never learned the lyrics properly, partly because he didn't use good diction and they didn't. They didn't print the uh, print the lyrics for some time. Uh, how about this one? Suspicious, Suspicious Minds by Elvis Presley, and you might remember how it starts. Caught in a trap, but that's not what I heard. I heard they call him a tramp. Um, there is uh, Bad Moon Rising by Creedence Clearwater Revival. And that opens with, there's a bad, or not opens with, but it has the lyric, there's a bad moon on the rise. But if you listen to that on a Saturday night, uh, you might have heard the lyric as, there's a bathroom on the right. Randy Bachman, who uh, has hosted the CBC uh, show, uh, radio show, radio program, Vinyl Tap, uh, uh, Randy Bachman of Bachman Turner Overdrive, and one of their biggest hits was called Taking Care of Business. And he said he was delighted when people misheard that as baking carrot biscuits, which uh, does uh, change a, a heavy rock and roll song into a cooking uh, a cooking uh, song. Um, I, uh, on uh, when I was doing uh, a piece on Mondegreens uh, on uh, CBC, it was uh, Christmas time, and so I presented these. Uh, Christmas carols with misheard lyrics. Deck the halls with Buddy Holly, we three kings of porridge and tar. And you can uh, try these out to uh, yourself. Bells on bobtail ring, making spare, spare ribs bright. Um, good King Wences car backed out on a piece of Stephen. Get dressed ye married gentlemen. He's making a list of chicken and rice. You'll go down in Listerine. So you might be able to add to uh, my collection of uh, misheard uh, Christmas carols. Actually, in some ways, I think these actually these may be uh, improvements on the, uh, the correct lyrics. We'll give the uh, uh, closing words uh, to uh, uh, Lemony Snicket, who wrote uh, in uh, Horseradish, Bitter Truths You Can't Avoid. In love as in life, one misheard word can be tremendously important. 
If you tell someone you love them, for instance, you must be absolutely certain that they have replied, I love you back and not I love your back before you continue the conversation. Otherwise, it's the difference between saying hello and saying goodbye. Now, let's uh, switch to intentional uh, misuse of uh, language, or I wouldn't say misuse, but entertaining use of language done on purpose. So I call this keep your wits. Uh, <clears throat> of course, you've probably noticed that the last syllable of my surname is wits, uh, spelled with a Z, not an S. But as my father uh, taught us from when I was a child, uh, the name is pronounced Berkowitz. It's heavy on the wits. And so I've used the W-I-T-Z, W-I-T-S uh, homophone uh, for most of, most of my life. In fact, people have said my uh, one-liners are Berkowitzisms. And by the way, uh, if you know a little German, you know that W-I-T-Z, bits, is German for joke. It all works beautifully. So this is a type of witticism called a chiasmus. Chiasmus uh, is where you uh, switch the order uh, in construction. I think it's better to give you some examples than to try to uh, explain it. <clears throat> in peace, sons bury their fathers. In war, fathers bury their sons. And this goes back 6th century uh, BCE. Uh, so this idea of, of witty use of language uh, goes back, uh, in this case, uh, uh, 2,600 years. Keep care of thy shop, and thy shop will keep care of you. And a brother may not be a friend, but a friend will always be a brother. So Benjamin Franklin uh, cites these in his uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. He doesn't know who the source is, but he uh, cites them. You'll, I'm, I'm sure, remember JFK's, the famous line from JFK's uh, inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And you're starting to see how the, uh, the, the uh, construction of the sentence uh, flips uh, parts of the phrases or clauses around. Here's champagne for, for our real friends and real pain for our sham friends. And these are brilliant uses of the language. So here is a, a collection of, of my favorites. So Dr. Samuel Johnson, who the great uh, uh, who wrote the, uh, the the first big dictionary in the English language, your manuscript, and he wrote this to an aspiring writer. Your manuscript is both good and original, but the part is, that is good is not original, and the part that is original is not good. Uh, let's flip down a little bit. Um, Peter Drucker, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. If you talk to God, you are praying. If God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. And this is my, uh, uh, this is one I like. I have a collection of uh, the difference between optimists and pessimists. Here's one of them. An optimist goes to the window every morning and says, good morning, God. The pessimist goes to the window every morning and says, good God, morning all on your outlook. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, has running added years to my life? No, but it's added life to my years. That was uh, from a 75-year-old marathoner. <clears throat> Try to learn something about everything and everything about something. Um, Shakespeare liked this as well. In Henry IV, Part Two, the Chief Justice says, your means are very slender and your waste is great. And Falstaff said, I would, my means were greater and my waist slenderer. And of course, the famous the line from uh, lines from Mae West, it's better to be looked over than overlooked. And the one you probably know, it's not the men in my life, it's the life in my men. Now, <clears throat> another category of witticisms or wit is what I call, uh, or what we call anti-proverbs. And this is, uh, you get some brilliance by changing a single word, like hair today, gone tomorrow. Uh, just looking at some of the people on screen, uh, including me, we've experienced that. Strike while the irony is hot. And you can see a subtle change makes for a, a really interesting take on a, on a cliche or an idiom or a proverb. 
Uh, chain, you can substitute two words. A brain is no stronger than its weakest think rather than a chain and its weakest link. If at first you don't succeed, quit. There's no use being a damn fool about it. So that's where you take the opening statement or the, the first part of it and change the second part goes in a completely different direction. You can extend, you can extend the original. <clears throat> Tough luck, said the egg in the monastery, out of the frying pan into the fryer. Man who lives by bread alone lives alone. Uh, necessity is the mother of strange bedfellows. That mixes up two things. Um, better never than late. And Mark Twain, uh, well, this is a nice one. Familiarity breeds. Uh, Mark Twain then took that one and said, familiarity breeds contempt and children. And <clears throat> here are some more anti-proverbs. Misery loves chocolate. A rolling stone gathers momentum. An onion a day keeps everybody away. And you know what all the originals are. These are just beautifully clever takes on them. Don't bite, don't bite the hand that looks dirty. To err is human, but to really screw things up requires a computer. Everything has an end, but a sausage has too. Nothing exceeds like excess. And this is my favorite. It takes a Viking to raise a village. Beautiful, uh, beautiful one. Now, I call those wits or wit and witticism. So let's call these half wits. These are mixed metaphors. What happens when, when <clears throat> you, um, you don't quite get the, uh, the, the idea of a metaphor, a colorful uh, figure of speech? Um, uh, Richard Letterer, the great uh, writer on, on language said, if you realize that you've mixed your metaphors, don't feel as if you've laid an egg or have egg on your face or that you're walking on eggshells or are sucking eggs. All of us in all walks of life blithely sail along mixing metaphors. How can you walk and sail at the same time? So he's between a rock and the deep blue sea. That's a horse of a different feather. I'm sticking my neck out on a limb. He threw a cold shoulder on that idea. So <clears throat> even uh, well-known writers uh, are not immune from this. Uh, Ian Fleming, in one of his James Bond books, wrote this. Bond's knees, the Achilles heel of all skiers, were beginning to ache. So <clears throat> you don't need to know a whole lot about anatomy to know that the Achilles heel and the knee are some distance uh, apart. And even Shakespeare mixed his metaphors. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. How can you actually take arms against a sea of troubles? So no one, including Shakespeare, was immune from the occasional mixed metaphor. Here are some great ones. The uh, the uh, detestable Ernest Bevan, uh, Britain, at least uh, that was the term that my late uh, father used for him, uh, Britain's post-war uh, foreign secretary. When you open that Pandora's box, you will find it full of Trojan horses. So he's a, a little weak on his uh, knowledge of uh, mythology. A leopard can't change his stripes. Barack Obama, as we consider the road that unfolds before us. So unfolding roads are rare. Also from Obama, Senator McCain suggests that somehow I'm green behind the ears. So these are all uh, uh, legitimate uh, statements. They've been, uh, they've been checked. Mitt Romney, the president threw in the white flag of a surrender. Surrender. You don't know what happened to the towel. And these from Rush Limbaugh. Button your seatbelts. Let's clear up a loose end. Brilliant sunshine, rain down. I don't think we should jump at straws here. Every Every one of them, a beautiful mixed metaphor. Dan Rather, they counted the votes until the cows had literally gone to sleep. And Sir Boyle Roche, Mr. Speaker, I smell a rat. I see him forming in the air and darkening in the sky, but I'll nip him in the bud. Here's some more. Share. I've been up and down so many times that I feel as if I'm in a revolving door. <laughs> An American Idol contestant, I was so excited, my heart about fell out of my stomach. Uh, Sandy on Survivor, I was the mother hen to all these little ducks. 
uh, I didn't take a lot of biology and uh, and zoology in in my uh, formal studies, but hens don't have ducks. Uh, member of the U.S. Olympic team, we can still hang our heads high. So that is mixed metaphors. Now let's look at another pair of M's, misplaced modifiers, and <clears throat> you will encounter these uh, everywhere. Misplaced modifier is where the grammar doesn't quite work. The a phrase or a clause or a word somehow is put in the wrong part of the uh, the sentence. And so you're kind of planted as in midair, uh, although that, I guess, would be a, a, a mixed metaphor. Um, <clears throat> a classic example is this. Ask the Minister of Agriculture if he will require eggs to be stamped with the date on which they were laid by the farmer. So did the farmer lay the eggs or is he stamping the date on the, on the eggs? Um, I learned about misplaced modifiers uh, when I was a kid and there's the great line from uh, Mary Poppins when uh, you probably remember the scene, Uncle Albert, the man who loves to laugh, uh, he tells this joke, I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. Oh really? What's the name of his other leg? And since childhood that's become a, that was a family favorite. Uh, and in fact, if uh, I or my sister or brother wanted to try to make uh, uh, the other two smile, all we would say is, I know, do you? And that was enough because we knew exactly what the joke was, the wooden leg named Smith. Um, a friend uh, sent me this from the New York Times. NASA has built X-ray detectors to study black holes that mimic lobster eyes. So. That makes you wonder, how can a black hole mimic a lobster eye? Well, it is not the black hole that mimics lobster eyes, it's the X-ray detectors. So uh, here is the challenge with uh, mixed uh, or with misplaced modifiers. Uh, choosing a short list and then reading them without breaking into giggles. So I will take a crack uh, at this. For anyone who has children and doesn't know it, there is a daycare on the first floor. No one was injured in the blast, which was attributed to a buildup of gas by one town official. Here are some suggestions for handling obscene phone calls from the New England Telephone Company. <clears throat> you can see many, many exquisite statues walking around the museum. Wow, these are fascinating statues. Lost, a walking stick by an elderly man with a curiously carved ivory head. The bride was given in marriage by her father wearing her mother's wedding gown. The poet showed up with socks up to his knees that didn't match. Don't you hate it when you don't have matching knees? With his tail held high, my father held his pride, led his prize bull around the arena. Uh, placed three drops in left eye every two hours while awake for five days. <clears throat> Children shall not drive golf carts under the age of 16. You have to really drive only the old golf carts. Uh, <clears throat> During the summer, my sister and I milked the cows, but now my father milks the cows in the morning and us at night. <laughs> Plunging a thousand feet into the gorge, we saw Yosemite Falls. She handed out brownies to children wrapped in wax paper. And I will just uh, skip uh, through these. Uh, Yoko Ono will talk uh, about her husband, John Lennon, who was killed in an interview with Barbara Walters. Vicious interview. <clears throat> Mrs. Jensen is reported to be resting comfortably by her doctor. Uh, please give this catalog to a friend if you have one. As you can see, I uh, had trouble coming up with a, a short list. Uh, California Governor Pat Brown discussing a local flood. This is the worst disaster in California since I was elected. I want to thank, this is Montreal mayor and I don't remember which one, probably Jean Drapeau, but I could be wrong. Uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from my wife's bottom too. <clears throat> the burglar was about 30 years old, white, five foot 10 with wavy hair weighing about 150 pounds. <laughs> that's heavy hair. Uh, please take time to look over the brochure that's enclosed with your family. Keep on going. Uh, let's just see. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation by the medical examiner. You gotta watch out for the medical examiners. And I am especially appealing to those of you who do not usually attend fundraising 
events. Irish bulls are similar, except that they are, they are, they're, they're said on purpose. And there's a, there's a meaning there that we, that, uh, well, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I, you'll see what I mean. I don't want to belong to any club that will have me as a member. The famous line from Groucho Marx. The best cure for insomnia is to get a lot of sleep. Uh, the food here is terrible and the portions are too small. These are famous examples from uh, great uh, uh, humorists. Always be sincere, if, even if you don't mean it. I'd give my right arm to be ambidextrous. Nostalgia isn't what it used to be. Monotheism is a gift from the gods. How many gods? Uh, gentlemen, it appears to be unanimous that we cannot agree. Half the lies our opponents tell about us are not true. And they're going to like it whether they like it or not. And they're, they're mixed up, but there's a, a sense in there that uh, maybe is true. Uh, Samuel Goldwyn, the great uh, uh, film uh, uh, mogul, uh, a lot, he mangled the language a lot. A lot of things are attributed to him. We don't know which ones uh, he really said, but these are the ones that uh, have kind of made the, the final cut. I never liked you and I always will. Don't talk to me while I'm interrupting. Uh, I have a mind like a steel sieve. The new atom bomb is dynamite. You're biting the hand of the goose that laid the golden egg. The sacred cows have come home to roost with a vengeance. <clears throat> As a kind of an addendum to this, malaphores are not quite malapropism. They're not quite mixed metaphors. There's just something amusing about them. The wrong word, uh, the wrong way. She's suffering from a detached rectum. They're diabolically opposed. These hemorrhoids are a real pain in the neck. People are dying like hotcakes. He's a little green behind the ears. I wouldn't eat that with a 10 foot pole. Take a flying hike. I hope he gets his curveball straightened out. We spent most of our time sitting on the porch, watching the cows playing Scrabble and reading. Those are educated cows. <coughs> so, I've left my um, I've left for the the end of this um, ambiguous headlines. When you read the uh, the the paper, if you still if you're like uh, 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 my wife and me, we actually get print copies of the newspaper and we pour over them. Well, Heather pours over them more than I do. Uh, <clears throat> I skim, but. If you read the newspapers regularly, you'll often encounter headlines that you have to read a second time to actually get the sense of what, uh, um, what was intended. And it's because headlines leave out all the little words. They leave out a lot of prepositions, articles. And so it means that um, there can be some ambiguity. Um, let me give you an example. March rescheduled to April. Now, the ambiguity here comes from the fact that we don't know whether March is a month uh, or it's a protest March. But it does seem like we're having we're playing havoc with the calendar if we've decided to delay the month of March to the month of April. Hershey bars protest. So <clears throat> are these uh, the chocolate bars? Are these Hershey bars? Or is it the uh, city of Hershey in Pennsylvania that has decided that they would bar some protest uh, uh, people's protest that was happening. And so you can see the the double meaning that the the words have without the the small uh, the small helper words, <coughs> uh, the meaning can be uh, ambiguous. This is a famous one that appeared in the Guardian newspaper. Uh, British left waffles on Falkland Islands. And you think, why would they leave waffles on the Falkland Island? The Falkland Islands. And of course you realize that left is not the verb, but it's the British left, as in the British left wing. And to waffle could be a noun, but it could also be a verb. To waffle, to go back and forth. So if the British left is waffling about what to do on the Falkland Islands, then it makes sense. But otherwise, you're wondering uh, why uh, there are egos uh, south of um, uh, the southern part of South America. I like this one. Gator attacks puzzle experts. What did we ever do wrong? I'm a puzzle expert. Why did gators attack us? Uh, of course, uh, puzzle could be the adjective describing the expert, or it could be a verb. So the gator attacks are puzzling 
to the experts who know about gators. So the uh, second meaning is fun. Um, <clears throat> the ideas of, uh, uh, or the idea of, of crash blossoms or ambiguous headlines, you'll find these collections of these in, uh, in lots of books about uh, fun with the, with the language. And I've uh, put together a, a, a collection of my favorites. <laughs> Doctor testifies in horse suit. <laughs> Uh, complaints about Major League Baseball umpires growing ugly. There's nothing that says that baseball umpires have to be handsome. So were the baseball umpires ugly or were the complaints ugly? Defendant's speech ends in a long sentence. Farmer Bill dies in house. And you think, oh, that's so sad. I wonder who Farmer Bill was. Until you realize it was a bill of uh, legislative uh, work that died in the house of representatives. Cancer Society honors Marlboro Man, which is very nice, um, or maybe not very nice. Uh, Marlboro is a, a township in New Jersey, not the cigarette smoking uh, uh, man on the Marlboro cigarette packages. Teacher strikes idle kids, bad teacher. Or maybe it's not a noun <laughs> of uh, the teacher actually hitting the idle kids, but teacher strikes as a noun, uh, sorry, not uh, strikes not as a verb, here it is as a noun. Yellow perch declined to be studied. So <clears throat> I guess uh, the researchers were looking for informed consent and the yellow perch said, no, thank you. We do not wish to be part of your research study. Grandmother of eight makes whole in one. If you're a golfer, that, you wouldn't see any, uh, uh, any ambiguity there, but, uh, if you weren't thinking golf, you'd wonder what the one was of her eight children. Uh, why did she make a hole in one of them? Eye drops off shelf. It's clearly not the eye that drops off the shelf. It's the eye drops that are off the shelf. Enraged cow injures farmer with axe. Watch out for those cows. About 10 years ago, uh, Ben Zimmer uh, wrote an article for the New York Times uh, and he introduced a new term for these ambiguous headlines, and he called them crash blossoms. And this came, uh, this was published uh, in an online discussion for uh, copy editors. And it came from an American editor based in Japan who noticed a headline that read, violinist linked to J-A-L crash blossoms. So the intended interpretation was about the blossoming career of an up-and-coming violinist whose father had died in a Japan Airlines plane crash. But <clears throat> if you treat crash as an adjective rather than a noun, then you get crash blossoms. So blossoms becomes the noun, uh, crash becomes the adjective, and you have a crash blossom rather than the crash separate and then the verb of blossoms. So uh, these have uh, 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 the, the term has picked up uh, uh, picked up popular or grown in popularity. Here's some more of them. Case of stolen whiskey expected to go to jury. Blind bishop appointed to see, and you need to know that uh, a see could be the holy see uh, as opposed to vision. Lingerie shipment hijacked. Thief gives police the slip. Officials suspended over a hotel fire. I guess that's like uh, toasting marshmallows. Citizens get shot at convention center. Sadly, that happens. Uh, that was supposed to be a vaccine uh, shot at the convention center, but sadly we read too much uh, news about people getting shot uh, with guns. Citizens complain about loud noise at city council meeting. Uh, have you ever attended a city council meeting? There's often loud noise there. Drug traffic reaches new high. And from Wall Street, the rest of the year may not follow January. I guess that's what happens when uh, March uh, is delayed till uh, April. Giant women's study short of volunteers. <clears throat> so I guess they don't have enough giant women who uh, have agreed to uh, be part of the study. New housing for elderly not yet dead. And even more, kids make nutritious snacks. <laughs> Dentist receives plaque, I'm supposed to remove it. 4-H girls win prize for fat calves. I'll just leave that one. One-legged assailant still on the run. Progress slow in beating death. 
yeah, we uh, people are still dying. We are not making that much progress in beating death. Two ships collide, one dies. Uh, this reminds us of the uh, barge that uh, seems to be stuck uh, <laughs> in uh, Stanley Park or on the uh, on the shore there. One died. Twenty year old friendship ends at altar. Old school pillars replaced by alumni. Man struck by lightning faces battery charge. Stadium air conditioning fails. Fans protest. So that is my uh, whirlwind tour through uh, entertaining aspects of uh, the English language. <clears throat> Before I wrap up, I would like to do a little bit of a book flog. A book flog. What uh, um, I, I mentioned this at the beginning. This comes. Uh, uh, this is part six of uh, six parts of. Uh, uh, the book that's just been uh, published called uh, Tales from the Word Guy, What Your English Teacher Never Taught You. Uh, it is already available through Friesen Press, and uh, soon it'll be available through Amazon. And when I can get around to, to the bookstores uh, locally, they will carry it, although you could always phone them uh, and ask them to order it. Um, and if you are an impatient sort and you want one immediately, I'm expecting delivery in the next couple of days, and you could actually get one directly from me. Now, <clears throat> books are never the product of one person. And this book particularly is not the product of one person. Uh, it's a collection of 57 essays. But these are essays that I delivered uh, orally. I did them on uh, CBC Radio. And to turn something from the oral voice to the written voice, or red voice, it needs, it needs a deft touch. So I found a tremendous uh, editor to take my oral text and turn it into written form. And that uh, uh, editor is uh, uh, with us tonight. So you can't see very much of her, uh, but you can see her name. Uh, the editor is Heather, my wife. Oh, there she's popped up her head. So uh, thanks uh, to Heather. Uh, the uh, errors and the uh, the spoken voice has been uh, all corrected and you get a, uh, a written masterpiece. Uh, <clears throat> if you haven't yet uh, uh, discovered the beauty of word puzzles, word play, uh, that's the, uh, the other book, The Whirl of Words that came out last summer. Um, I had actually a productive pandemic. Uh, I managed to publish two books. So uh, I'm hopeful that the pandemic is over because uh, I don't want to have to write a, a third one. So uh, I would be happy to open uh, up the uh, the uh, uh, the airwaves, the Zoom airwaves. Uh, if you have questions or comments or contributions, um, thank you for the opportunity once again to to talk to uh, this uh, this group. I love sharing my love of the language and, and the entertaining aspects of English. Thanks very much. <clears throat> You're welcome to open up uh, your, your unmute yourself. People ask me uh, what, uh, what was the hardest part about uh, teaching uh, online? I taught about let's see, 182 lectures uh, online for UBC. And I said there was a big health concern. And they said, oh, they were quite nervous. They were quite worried. I said, what was the health concern? I said, uh, severe hearing loss. And they said, hearing loss? I said, yes, I would deliver a, a hilarious, clever one-liner. And I couldn't hear anybody laugh because they were all muted. Mm. So feel free to unmute yourself so I can hear you smile or hear you laugh and see you smile. Jonathan. Um, I'm just wondering, it's Larry here, is there a correlation between um, the ability to um, create puns and intelligence? Has there been any studies done on that? that sort not, of thing? not puns directly, uh, <clears throat> but uh, puns are a result of listening closely to the language and <clears throat> thinking about the ambiguity that comes from the fact that words have multiple definitions. Uh, take, find a, find a dictionary 
open it up to not a, a complex word, but a simple word like draw or, or put or mark. And you discover there are many, many, many definitions of uh, the word. You could, uh, <clears throat> and if you use uh, the uh, if you use one meaning in place of another, you can uh, come up with a, a pun. You can also find words that uh, uh, sound uh, uh, alike. So homophones will lead to puns. So, for example, if there's a grizzly uh, chasing you, uh, <clears throat> um, this is a, one of my favorite stories about uh, a tour bus uh, in the Rockies, and uh, all of the uh, the tourists are uh, out taking <laughs> pictures of nature, okay. and a grizzly shows up. Uh, and so the bus driver and the tour guide say, come on, everybody, come back to the, uh, uh, to the bus. So most of the people go back to the bus, except there's one laggard who is uh, still taking pictures of the, of the bear, of the, of the grizzly. And the bear is starting to advance on uh, the uh, photographer, on the tourist. And so now the tourist is starting to run towards the, uh, to the bus. And he just uh, just gets to the bus uh, front door, and the bus driver closes the door before he can get on. <clears throat> and everybody says, "Why did you do that?" Remember that the grizzly is chasing this uh, this uh, tourist. And everybody on the bus says to the bus driver, "Why did you close the door?" And the bus driver said, "Well, we have a rule: nobody is allowed to be on this bus with a bear behind." <laughs> and so. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's using a homophone of bear. So it's the awareness of uh, of uh, the language, uh, looking for patterns, which I still think is the hallmark of of intelligence. And you combine those, and you end up with uh, puns. Jonathan, uh, somebody's asking why are crash blossoms called that? So uh, Heather asked that, and I explained that uh, I think probably after she typed it into the. Uh, into the chat, yeah. uh, I, I gave the the history of the uh, of the crash blossom. All right. Do I have any contributions to my uh, uh, my uh, Christmas carols or my uh, song lyrics um, or song titles with pun in them? Didn't notice any come by in the in the chat. So I hope that. What I have done is attune you to uh, listening to language, uh, especially when you hear people who you think should know how to use the language properly, uh, don't. Uh, so radio commentators, uh, speakers of, of all kinds, listen to their use of language and see, <clears throat> ah, there's a mixed metaphor. That's a dangling or a misplaced modifier. That could be taken multiple ways. All of these are entertaining. And using the wrong word in the wrong place, also uh, opportunity for hilarity. Uh, Jonathan, um, thank you so much. I absolutely love your presentations, I have to tell you. Um, awesome. Hilarious and yet suspiciously educational. Uh, <laughs> Uh, don't think we don't know that. Um, fantastic. I would have loved to have been a student in your courses. Um, do you still teach, by the way? I still teach. Yeah, I have uh, taught for 40 years. I have taught over 17,000 students okay. and I still do it because I love uh I love being in the classroom, having all these young people who have never heard my jokes before. And so uh, my teaching is, uh, it's a combination of educating and entertaining.